and we are learning lessons while we are looking at the kings and their relationship with God, how God relates to them, how they relate to the God, to the Lord, and we are learning. So in the family genealogy, we have David, who reigned for 40 years, then transferred the kingdom to Solomon, who also reigned for 40 years. Then last week, we saw Rehoboam, who reigned for 17 years. And today, we are going to examine uh, Abijah and find out what we can about him. So we go to our text today to start with. Roboham slept with his fathers and was buried, and his son Abijam, or Abijah, depending on first king or second chronicle, reigned in his place. And in the 18 years of King Jeroboam, which was the king of the northern tribes that split from Judah, Abijah began to reign over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. And there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. So it would be very simple to summarize the life. If you read in Second Chronicle, the life of uh, Abijah, three years, war against Jeroboam. That is what he's done. This is what we, you, you will learn. If you, ju if you turn in your Bible and you just re read the text, this is what you will learn about him. That's it. And that's what we normally will do, isn't it? You just do your devotion, you read it, turn the page, go to the next one. Next one will be King Asa, the son of Abijah, and then you go on. But there's so much more to learn about, and we will try to discover a bit more. So what Abijah accomplished during his, his reign is a war. But why did he go to war? Why was it important to him? We'll discover it this morning. Uh, so... He reigned, and this war started with his father 17 years from the time of the divisions. They have been at war. Rehoboam died. His son Abijah came to reign. The war continued because it was against the same king of Israel in the northern kingdom. And you will discover that King Abijah was, and his life, life mission, his, his worldview what he felt that he would leave as a legacy after he would depart would be to bring back Israel to unify the nation again. So that is his goal, that is his life mission. He was entirely preoccupied with bringing Judah, uh, bringing Israel back with Judah once again to make one united nation. It was his life mission. He was not a good diplomat. So what he did, he tried to bring Israel back by force. To to, his solution was, let's war, we'll win over them, we'll force them back with us. So when we go a little bit further and our uh, reading of that, uh, these events, you see that Abijah went out to battle with 400,000 soldiers. That's a lot of soldiers. 400,000 but Jeroboam had 800,000. So that's a big battle. It will be a very bloody uh, battle. So Abijah's uh, army is outnumbered by two to one. So does that make sense? Would you go to war against an army that is twice as much as you, better equipped, professional soldiers? They are two to one. So normally you wouldn't do. So why was Abijah willing to go to battle when most likely he has no chance of success? So when you, you read in the chapter that comes in, you will see that before the battle, Abijah gave a very noteworthy speech, very, very striking speech, very strong and courageous uh, and, and his way to, to this. And when you look at the speech that he will give, and we will be doing that in a moment, you will grasp or you will understand his reasoning. What, what, what motivated him? What gave him the courage? Wh why is he doing something that is almost sure to lose and to, to have confidence to go? So 
In the next slide here, this is, you will see five points of, uh, of, his, of his speech, and we will be looking at it quickly. Don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, made an unbreakable covenant or promise with David, giving him and his descendants, and I insist on his descendants, kingship over Israel forever. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, you have rebelled against Solomon, the king chosen by God. So you are a rebel. You came to be a king out of a military coup. This is unjust. Uh, you disobeyed God. You disobeyed. You were rebellious. This is how you became king. So God has promised David and his descendants a kingship forever. So that is his motivation. He's really strong on that. I'm the descendant. I'm the one who should be ruling. This is according to the promise of God. So he is not wrong into thinking like this. He's actually very, very, very uh, clear on that. So point number one, the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom uh, to David forever, the kingship. But Jeroboam rebelled against the, the Lord. Point number two, Jeroboam turn the people of God away from the Lord and lead them into worship. You read that with this. The, they had their own uh, cows and uh, they worshiped the cows and they had altars, you know, and everything. Point number three, we read it in verse nine. It's actually taken quote from verse nine. Haven't you already driven away the Lord's priest and made your own? So that the, the priests that were... Uh, appointed forever by the Lord were the descendants of Aaron and they were to lead the worship, the sacrifice, the burnt offering and all the type of offerings uh, every day. But uh, King Jeroboam sent them away and he appointed some anybody to become his own kind of, of priest. So that was really wrong to do that. So we kind of understand where he's going with that. And then the next point, but as for us, the Lord is our God and we have not forsaken him. We have priests ministering to the Lord who are the sons of Aaron. So we have the real thing here. Uh, for we keep the charge of the Lord. Everything he commanded about the uh, priesthood, we are following it every day. They offer the morning and the evening sacrifice. The offering is being, the bread is being put in the, in the tabernacle. We're doing everything. But you have forsaken him. Look. God is with us at our head. He is our captain. He is the commander in chief. And his priests are with us, the priests that are uh, the, the descendants of Aaron with the battle trumpets. They will call the battle. So, son of Israel, do not fight against the Lord, the God of your fathers, for you cannot succeed. So, point number four, you have forsaken the Lord. We have the real things. We have the priests. We continue to offer the offerings. What the Lord we do what the Lord has commanded, but you have abandoned him. Point number five, the Lord is at our head. We have the Lord. The Lord is with us. You cannot win about that. Don't fight. If you fight, you will not be victorious. So this is a very striking and very special uh, speech that, uh, in fact, gives Jeroboam an opportunity to say, yes, you're right, to repent and say, okay, what, what should we do next? But instead, he ignored this. He didn't seize the opportunity to repent. And he was probably, think about it, confident in his military force. He's got 800 uh, uh, trained professional soldiers on his side. So speak, speak whatever you want. I'm going to win. I'm going to destroy you. So another thing that we can see in his attitude is that he underestimated the degree of his sin. What Jeroboam had done against the Lord was an abomination to the Lord. He really did. But he underestimated the sin, the degree of his sinfulness, and he disregarded it. And uh, the consequence of his actions as well. And this is a warning. There's a warning for us also in that text here. Because the question is, do we also 
at times underestimate the degree of our sinfulness, the degree of sins that surrounds us in our society. Because we live in a society of, of tolerance. We live in a, in a society where you hear a lot of uh, sexual promiscuity. Uh, actually, I was reading in uh, Canada now the, some uh, articles uh, this week. Uh, there's a lot of bullying in schools. That never happened before. But now it's re becoming like a, a national problem, the bullying and also the, the sexual uh, harassments of girls uh, from grade seven and things like that in school all over the nations and things like that. So these things are happening. So we have a lot of, of uh, uh, discussions and uh, things around us that influence. So it is easy in our generation to s slip away and to underestimate the degree of sinfulness and uh, becoming more tolerant about that. So uh, we, we see that in his speech that uh, real, uh, Abijah is saying to Jeroboam, your new gods cannot help you. We have the Lord as our captain. But Abijah was very courageous. He stood up and he challenged Jeroboam. The Lord is our God and we have not forsaken him. So now if we only go a little bit further, you will see a bit of the, of the battle of this. During this time, Jeroboam had sent an ambush to attack from the, the rear. When the army of Judah turned around to look, they were being attacked from the front and from the back. So they cried out to the Lord, Lord, come and help us. And the priest blasted the war trumpet. And then at that moment, then the big things uh, happen here. The fate of the soldiers is being stretched. How can you win? You are outnumbered two to one, and then you have in the back and in the front. And when the men of Judah shouted, I want you to pay attention to what comes next. God defeated Jeroboam. God defeated Jeroboam, not the army. God defeated Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. The men of Israel fled before Judah and God gave them into their hands. So two times, God defeated, God gave them. Abijah and his people struck them with great force and there's slain half a million trained professional soldiers as a result of that battle. You can imagine how bloody this battle are. It's hard to imagine. A few years ago, in a, in a town called Sujo and the Museum of War over there, a battle where the nationalists who were supported by the American weapons and everything were fighting against the communists, but the communists had received at the last moment uh, some help from the Russians and uh, strengthened their military force and then took over one battle that lasted a long time half a million people died. And you, you had all the photos of, of, the, of the dead, of the fields, the battles, all the things. It was very bloody. So I was thinking, we're reading this text. Sometimes you, you read these old stories and it, you don't connect with the, the, the horror, you don't correct with what's happening, but it, it, did, it did happen. And I want you to notice that it is God who gave them the victory. So the question to ask here is, why did the Lord chose choose to intervene in favor of Judah. And then we, we see it in the next uh, verse here. Judah prevailed because they relied upon the Lord, the God of their fathers. And you will see this is a repeated message throughout the book of Chronicles. When you rely on the Lord, when you will follow the Lord faithfully, you worship God. You don't uh, go to idols and everything. You do what the Lord wants. You, you please the Lord you will experience a sorts of different forms of blessing on your life, some sorts of prosperity. God is on your side. You have confidence. You have peace. Something good's going to happen into your life, generally speaking. Of course, it's not always the case, 100% uh, because we have to understand the big picture of life. But generally speaking, prosperity and good things will come to you. But when you rebel and you turn to idolatry, you, the consequence of sin 
will find you eventually and you will suffer consequences in your life. So that is one of the, of the reasons. Jeroboam did not recover his power in the days of Abijah and the Lord struck him down and he died. When the Lord struck him down, okay, some commentary says maybe he got uh, harmed during the battles and never recovered from being harmed or it is something completely separate. He was struck by a disease or a stroke or something and anyway, he died uh, two years later. And then Abijah, on the contrary, grew mighty and he took 14 wives and had 22 sons and 16 daughters. So that's, that's pretty much, okay. Should keep him busy for a while. So there's a comparison here between Jeroboam who was unfaithful and did evil and Abijah who relied uh, upon the Lord. So there's something more I want us to look at because now this is like the main text about Abijah, if you, if you read the Eternal Bible, as I says, this is the story, it's finished, go to the next king. But there's, there is mo much more that we can, that we can learn about him. Uh, we have to go back into some of the family line. Look at his family and his background to understand, because you can read these, these king quickly, the life is finished, and then says he died, and the next one comes, and the, the rest of the acts of this king are written in the annals of da, 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 da. And that's it. And then you go to the next. But there is so much more. So here I want you to pay attention to Rehoboam and Abijah. We'll learn something about their family. And that's actually the, the main point of, of, of the message that I want to bring this morning. Rehoboam was 41 years when he began to reign. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Nama the Ammonitus. He did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. So that's, we, we discussed that last week quite in detail. So I don't want to go back on all of these, but I, I'll make a point in a, in a while. Abijah became king over Judah. He ruled for three years in Jerusalem. His mother was Mahaka, the daughter of Abishalom or Absalom. He followed all the sinful practices of his father before him. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his God as his ancestor David had been. Or his heart was not perfect as the heart of his grandfather David had been. So we have a summary of David, of uh, King, King Jero, uh, Rehoboam here. And uh, we have concluded last week that he did evil because his heart was not committed. We discussed that last week. His heart was not uh, set to seek the Lord. Now when we come to Abijah, uh, we know when he began to uh, reign. He reigned for three years. And uh, we see that both father and son, the reigns was much shorter than great-grandfather and grandfather as well. And we need to ask two important questions here. Why did Rehoboam didn't set his heart to seek the Lord? What was his family upbringing? What was the influence over his life? D look at David in relation to uh, Solomon. When David died, you can read many chapters of David speaking to Solomon telling him to serve the Lord. What will happen if you don't? The Lord, the plan of the Lord, the building of the temple, the, the responsibility of being a follower of God and the, the future king of Israel. So there's a lot. He passed a lot. He passed a legacy of faith. He transmitted this faith, the fear of the Lord. He exhorted his son. He really spoke to him in his last moment. He gave him his best. He really gave him an example of uh, faithfulness. So Solomon started so well. We have studied Solomon so well. And then we read that, unfortunately, at the end of his life, he had so many wives, and many of his wives were not followers of God. They were uh, uh, idolat from idolatrous nations, and they bent his heart to idolatry. And then he had Rehoboam, who came to be a king. So that's why I want to look a bit deeper uh, into the family history of these two kings. Why did Rehoboam did not set his heart to seek the Lord? Uh, 
And why did Abijah follow all the sinful practices of his father before him? Why? There's the reasons. All of us, we, we are the produce of our parents' influence, of, our, of many uh, things in, in, our, in our life. You, uh, if you were raised in a Christian family or a Catholic family or, or your parents were atheists or if you had good parents, bad parents, the kind of schools you went, the society you grew up. If you grew up in a, a Muslim society, you'll probably be a Muslim. If you grew up in a Christian uh, kind of co countries, then you probably will end up having some influence of Christianity. So everything that we have experienced in childhood, even from our grandfather. I remember the, when I was very young, my mother would bring us to my grandfather's home. And then on New Year's, uh, not New Year's, uh, the January 1, we would kneel in front of our grandfather, then he would bless us. He would give us the blessing. I, 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 something that I remember from, from my, my grandfather. Uh, so it, it leaves a mark on you. You have a certain uh, th things that shape uh, your your uh, and your upbringing. The what kind of a husband you will be loving, uh, careless, attentive, uh, uh, romantic, or cold, or playful, or serious, or like it, it comes from a lot of things. I remember one time in the Philippines. We were in Tagaytay during a pastoral conference, and uh, one pastor's wife came to confide in me that night and telling me how she was unhappy with her husband. And the husband was actually a very good man, very faithful to God, very faithful to the ministry, but the wife could not feel content because she grew up in a family where there was a lot of uh, hugging, kissing, playing, a lot of emotions were being shared. And her husband had been raised as an orphan. Never experienced that warmth and everything. So he could not give it to his wife. So he was very faithful, very straightforward and uh, hardworking for the Lord, but could not satisfy this need that the wife has. So. I'm bringing these things to, to help us understand the social context, the family context of why a king behaves in a certain way and not in another way at the same time. So why Rehoboam and why Abijah were not faithful to God? And we read the very, the, this is the verdict of God, uh, the evaluation of God that we read. So let's go for some of the, of the possible reason of that. First of all, you will see here that the queen mother was an Ammonitus, Ammonites nation, mother of Rehoboam. It's mentioned twice in First King, it's mentioned in Chronicles that she was. The writers of both books want us to know that the mother has a role to play in this. This is important. It is repeated more than one time. You know, they, they could ignore it and just mention the father is the son of this. But the mother is mentioned, and she is Ammonitus. Okay. So uh, let me read a text that we don't have here. Rehoboam passed away, was buried in his ancestors in the city of David. His mother was an Ammonite named Naama. His son Abijah replaced him as king. So then if we go to Rehoboam's mother, it will catch our attention as, as, we, as a possible reason for the failure of Rehoboam's rule. The father, Solomon, had married foreign wives who had turned his heart away. We, we, we studied that already, remember? So the foreign wives turned their hearts away. They bent his heart. So Rehoboam's mother was one of Solomon's wife and Abijah's grandmother. It, she was an Ammonitus. She could have been one who has bent the height of Solomon to compromise and turn to worship other God. So she has become the main influencer. Now I want you to understand another thing that is, uh, uh, I think it's important for us to, to think a little bit deeper into these things. Solomon had, was 900 concubines, and I don't know how many wives, like you, you know, like uh, about a thousand, okay. So how do you develop an, uh, a self-image as a child 
in such a family. How many children did he have? We don't even know how many children. So let's say you are one of Solomon's son. How do you break through? How do you get chosen by your father to be the next in line? How did Rehoboam, it was decided by Solomon, you are the one who will be the next. He's probably had a few thousand brothers and sisters. I don't know. What kind of upbringing? What is the social life? What is the dynamic of, of, of the family of the time? Who do you think that a father who has 1,000 children, let's say 1,000, it could be 2,000 or more, the father has 1,000 children, how much influence will he give to each of his children? So who becomes the influencer of that child? Probably the mother. So we, we read this and you get something new in your mind. Okay, maybe the mother is the influencer. She's an Ammonite. And she is probably one of the wife that Solomon really liked and pay attention to and probably worship her God at, at the, in his old age. And then the, the Ro Roboham, which has become the favorite son of that, of that wife and the king, the chosen one, becomes the next in line. And then you read that he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. His heart was not perfect as the heart of his grandfather, uh, David. So, so we, we kind of get an idea of that. Now let's go to uh, Abijah's mother. Abijah's mother, or his grandmother was an Ammonitess. She could have been, okay, the one we described. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Abijah's mother's name was Maka or Micaiah, depending on which book you're looking, there's a difference. And there are different theories why the names could be different in one book and the other. Maybe sometimes the name gets changed when uh, uh, she becomes queen or something like that. Uh, she is called the daughter of Abishalom or Absalom in Second Chronicle chapter 11, and uh, of the daughter of Uriel in chapter 13. And I want you to, let me see, okay to help you understand a little bit the genealogy. Otherwise, it's kind of getting confusing on that. So you have David, who had many wives and had many sons. Okay, so to make it simple, I did not list all of his sons because they are listed in the Bible. But we go to Solomon, okay? Solomon had many wives, like 900, 1,000. But <laughs> that one became important. She was an Ammonitess. And he had a son, well, among his son, you know the story with Absalom, because now we are learning these names are being uh, marked uh, in our stories of these kings, okay? So you have the wife and you have the son, okay? Absalom had a daughter, Tamar, and the uh, commentaries think that Tamar would have married Uriel, which would explain why the Maka was called the daughter of Uriel in one of the books and was called the daughter of Absalom and the other one. Rehoboam married Maka. Uh, let me see, right. Yeah. So Absalom's the grandmother, the mother, of Abijah. So you can see now the, the line. So you have the line here, the influence of that mother and the influence of that mother over here. So it explained a lot to, to us. Uh, let me see if I can retrieve a little bit this text here. Okay. The verse before that text here says, Rehoboam married his cousin, Mahalat, the daughter of David's son, Jerimoth, and of Abihel, the daughter of Eliab, son of Jesse. I did not include it here because it will confuse everybody, and we are already confused now, so. <laughs> <laughs> We're already confused, okay. So he married, uh, but the one thing I wanted to say about this, 
he married a cousin or, or a, a cousins of uh, many degrees, okay? He's the daughter of David. Remember David, Solomon, and Rehoboam? So now he married uh, cousins from many degrees of David's son, uh, and we know the name, Jeremoth here, and a daughter of Eliab, son of Jesse. You know that David had brothers when he was selected and anointed by King Solomon, and he, had, he was the seventh in line of a bunch of brothers. So Eliab was one of them. So anyway, <laughs> sorry for bothering you with all of these things. <laughs> yeah, okay, now this is the place here. Later, okay, the, the first wife he married was kind of a, a legitimate wife, like the, 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 the the right in terms of being legitimate. Later, Rehoboam married another cousin, Mecca, the granddaughter of Absalom. Mecca gave birth to Abijah. Ta -la 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 -la. <laughs> Rehoboam loved Mecca. That is a love story here. Mecca loved Ma Rehoboam loved Mecca more than any of the otherwise, oh, now we're getting to know something more. Rehoboam loved Mecca more than any of the other wives and concubines. In all, he had 18 wives and 60 concubines. It's not bad, isn't it? <laughs> it's it's a, a bit less than Solomon, but it's actually quite, quite performing, okay? 18 wives and 60 concubines, and he gave birth to 28 sons and 60 daughters. So, but he loved that one more. So which I explained to us, and then look at the rest. Rehoboam appointed Mecca's son Abijah as leader among the princes, making it clear that he would be the next king. Aha. So among 28 sons and 60 daughters, it is clear, says making it clear, that he would be the next king. So, now let's go back to the dynamic of the family. You have a family where the king is so busy making war, he's a politician, he has 80 some children, and he's choosing one to be the next in line. How do you think this young man was groomed? in comparison to the rest of his brothers and sisters. He is selected out and he is being trained to know and understand the family story. David, the promise of David, Solomon, the temple, so that he will be really impacted by this knowledge of the family. We are the ones who receive the promise of the kingship. We are special in the eyes of God. God has set us aside, okay? So he's groomed. And to the kingship rules, regulations, how to be a king in politics, that's how he grew up. So when he became king, he went to war. And that's why he gave this remarkable speech. It says, we have received this promise. Out of our family, we receive kingship forever. You, Jeroboam, rebelled against God, because God has appointed us, and that's why he wants to go to, go to, to war. And then, unfortunately, we read that uh, he followed all the sinful practices of his father. And you read in the Bible that all these sinful practices of his father, which he had done before him. So the father's example before his eyes. He's, he's growing in the family. He's being groomed. He's being selected apart. So he's close to his father. He has a family story, a grandmother that is a Ammonite, and he has a mother that comes from Absalom, and Absalom was not really a, a follower of God. He was rebellious as well. So then he grew up in that kind of, he was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord as his grandfather David has. Amen? So I want to look at one other text here, because we want to compare with David here. You know, sometimes you wonder, why is God blessing a king that is not really, really from the heart following God? 
like Abijah. We, we, we read that he, he practiced all the sinful practice of his father the, that he has seen done. And still, God bless Judah under his command. So we need to answer that. Nevertheless, for David's sake, it's because of a bigger picture, a bigger promise. God sometimes, like we, we, we only analyze our situation, our problems, and the promise that concerns our daily life, our daily needs. But God is looking at the big pictures. Like now we are talking about four generations later. David, Solomon, Rehoboam, Abijah, and, and God is reminding us it's for David's sake that I'm doing that. I'm not doing it for Rehobo Rehoboam. I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it because I'm faithful to my promise. I promise something to David, and I'm going to keep it. I'm promising to David because he, he, to maintain his dynasty and Jerusalem by giving him a son to succeed him and by protecting Jerusalem. He did this because David had done what he approved and had not disregarded any of the commandments in his entire lifetime, except for the incident involving Ur Uriah the Hittite. So, and as I said before, when God says the heart of Abijah is not uh, uh, perfect as the heart of his grandfather David, it's not that David was perfect. It is that he was perfect in the sense he was wholeheartedly following God. He never turned to idolatry. He never was unfaithful to other gods. And that's what made him uh, evaluated as perfect or whole or complete, totally loyal to the Lord. So that is what distinguished David and earned the, earned the favor of God toward, toward them. Amen? So anyway, uh, we learn all of these wonderful lessons, and then we come back to our, the dynasty of this and the, the wives and, and everything that happened. And then by looking at some of the details, you know, when you read the Bible, if you read this chapter, you will not get that. You need to stop. Oh, the mother turn back, find the scriptures, go to cross-reference and start to take notes. That's called studying the Bible. There's reading the Bible, there's studying the Bible. So that's, that's what makes it. I'm bringing this, I, I hope I did not bore you too, too much with all of these things, but I, I was thinking that it may get you to desire to do a little bit more uh, paying attention to text and discovering something. Actually, it's important. You see, we would have missed a lot of things concerning Abijah's. We would not even discover why, uh, answer any questions about him, and any knowledge about him we would not know. Now we know some of the whys, at least the pos possible answer to some of our big questions. So, just in closing, I want to uh, remind us that there are two levels of responsibility here. We see in that story a story of family. It's a story of family, like your family. Think about yourself. Some of you, I don't know, we don't have so many grandparents here in this room, but eventually, if the Lord tarries, some of you will be grandparents. Like me, I have five grandchildren. How many great-grandchildren will I have? And how many great-great-grandchildren will I have? I don't know. But if you start thinking in this way, you see a big picture, and it reminds me of eternity, the eternity of God, how God plans. Because me, I only plan for my life. I only, I only plan for, for that, that bit here. That's my life. But then I have my children, my grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, and what comes next. God is from eternity to eternity. So he knows your past, uh, grandfather's story and everything, your ancestor's story, and he knows what's come after. So God has a big plan for you and for your, child, for your children. So there are two levels of responsibility. What are you going to leave as a legacy? To, uh, of transmitting, how successful will you be to transmit your faith to your descendants. God promised that he will 
bless the house of the righteous and his son's sons or children's children. So there is a promise to God. God says that he will bless the family of the righteous to 1,000 generations, but he will punish to three or four generations. There's so, all sorts of texts like this. There are some very strong commandments that we have to train and equip and remind and teach our children. And uh, so we have parental responsibility, but we have also personal responsibility. You, you do the best that you can as a parent, as you understand God and your faithfulness to God, it does not guarantee the total allegiance of your children, of all of your children to the Lord. But at least it's on the good side. It's on the good side. Because they have also their own life experience, the other source of influence in their life, and the curiosity of their personalities and the choices that they will make in their life. So, but as for us, from generation to generation, we are leaving out a spiritual heritage, inheritance. What will it be? What will it be written on your tombstone? What will your grandfather or your grandchildren or something will say about you when they go to you attend your funeral service? Uh, because that's going to happen. And uh, so that's, that is important because it leaves something. When I talk to my mom, my mom is 92. She will be 93 in the coming uh, beginning of the next year. She, in her old, old age, she talks a lot about her father and her mother. The good things and things that she regrets, that she was not close enough, that she did not understand, things like that. So she remembers because her, her memory, a long memory, is very good. But the, now she's forgetting the, the, the thing uh, of today. But she remembers. But she, she thinks a lot about uh, my, my grandfather and the parents and everything. So what kind of a legacy are we going to, to leave behind? So there is a parental responsibility and there is an individual responsibility. And each human, we have our own individual will. And the most important gift that we can leave our children, the most effective influence, is not only the words of our mouth. Don't do this, do that, la 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 la, don't behave like this. Eh? It's not like only this, even the, the words of the Bible. But it is the, the daily faithfulness, your allegiance, your love for the Lord that will leave the most, the deepest uh, mark, of the, like the greatest influence of faith will how you have been a, a lover of God, a followers of God, that you have put your priorities in God. It's, it's the most serious proof that you really believe in God. You can speak words, I, how many Christians we speak words and then uh, we, we don't practice it. We're not consistent. So our faithfulness remains the greatest gift to our children. The way you follow the Lord consistently. And Lord, may the legacy of our life be one of faithfulness, of obedience, of being wholeheartedly following the Lord so that friends, colleagues, families, children or grandchildren will recognize the, the truth of the word, the impact of God, the joy of the Lord, the contentment of living the Christian life, the wisdom of scriptures, the practical applications of the commandment of the Lord in our lives, the good things that are coming out of a life of following the Lord.